Thank you. Okay, now this, in case you're wondering, I, I was approached a few years ago with a Hollywood producer, and he was, wanted me to take part of a TV series, and he wanted from me a, a demo reel, if you will. And I submitted a few, but this is one of, one of my last edited version, and I'm going to show that first, is basically he wanted to see what I'm all about, how I look like in front of the screen, and a little bit of background uh, based on investigations. So let me go ahead and start with, this is a short video. for the, uh, you should hit and you should play. Well, you could do play from the beginning, go to, uh, uh, or even push F5 if you can see. It's not going too good. Played a while ago. Oh. There it is. Okay, so apparently the project fell through. I guess I wasn't pre pretty enough. Um, okay, this is the my first slide. Um, I it took me a couple of years to write this book, and it covers basically from the time I started as a ghost hunter, and I joined uh, later on a the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. I did some of the uh, research with this group. And I've captured a lot of very interesting apparitions, if you will, on film, on 35 millimeter film. So I do ha still have the negatives. So I brought a whole bunch of books with me. I think I have two lefts. So I sold out, sold most of it, but it's available in, um, at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Walmart. So, okay, a little bit about myself. Um, back in probably mid-1983, uh, uh, from Maryland, I moved to Virginia. And I n needed to add a little spice into my life, and I, um, got, obtained a private investigator's license in the state of Virginia. It was a, some 40 hour course. And that was pretty fascinating. I, I enjoy the in, intricate gathering information, going out, and yes, even sneaking around, taking photographs. But um, a little more on that. Um, in 2000, I became a ghost hunter, joined a local group in Virginia. I, um, the name of the group was DC Mag. I do not believe they're still um, doing field investigation and the Bigfoot uh, research as well. And during the, I would say within the early 2000, Sci-Fi Channel came out with a new TV series called Ghost Hunters. Everybody fell in love with it. And because of that, there's a whole lot of groups running around everywhere, trespassing, running around in graveyards, and even a couple of houses were set on fire because they were lighting candles, tried to mess around with Ouija boards and that for me left a very bad taste in my mouth. So I decided to continue investigating into the 
strange and paranormal and I joined MUFON, an excellent organization, back in 2004. And within a couple of weeks, actually, I would say a couple of months, I became a field investigator. And through the years, they gave me really awesome, it just happened to be the right place at the right time. They gave me really, really awesome cases involving lights in the sky, triangles, uh, rectangles, uh, strange entities appearing, disappearing, which I'm sort of used to that in the field of ghost hunting. And, and even with entities, it's almost, it has a similarity of the way they appear and disappear in a blink of an eye. So there is, I believe, a connection with that. In 2007, MUFON headquarters decided to develop a new rapid response team. It's called a STAR, star team, Strike Team for Area Research. And I decided to join. And they said, Norm, you're in it already. So that was a little an explanation with this unit is if you like like to compare it with let's say a police department they're doing a case involving serial killing i know it's pretty exaggerating but and then they they ask the fbi to assist to get a, a different perspective in in this field so basically the star team was like that we were on call 24 hours a day. Uh, let's say someone in Wisconsin or California or whoever let's say, uh, needed assistance uh, with the star team. They would we'll get a call, we grab our bags, jump in a car or plane, and sent down to uh, whichever state to assist the team. So during that time, Shortly after I joined the strike team, I got a, um, I received a call from um, the James Car Carrion. He was the head, president within MUFON, and he called me. He goes, Norm, I need you to go to North Carolina. I was residing in, I was living in, um, um, Virginia at the time, North Northern Virginia. And he called me, he goes, Norm, grab your bag, you need to go to North Carolina, Fayette, Fayetteville, North Carolina. There's a gentleman there that witnessed a lot of orbs, UFOs, even, um, I guess you want to say entities, uh, aliens, if you will. Now, I said, what What about the, uh, the field investigators in at that state, what happened to him? He said he has to step aside for a few months. So you need to go down there yesterday. I grabbed my bag, went down there. And this case you may be familiar with, um, that is the Christopher Bledsoe uh, abduction. I met with him. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. but. That is one of the most fascinating case I've ever had work work with. Um, press too many buttons here. In 2009 and 10, shortly after this um, team, um, I don't know if you, any of you ever heard of Robert Bigelow. He's all over the place, even with the skin Skinwalker Ranch. He used to own that property there. Um, he teamed up with MUFON and said, hey, um, they wanted us, they wanted the best of the best field investigators to join his group to be on call quickly, 24, within 24 hours to investigate closing counters of the second and third kind. And I was one of the first to be um, to join and to be given a case within that um, new um, the Bass team, and quickly the next slide. I was I'm a former, currently former 
field investigator with MUFON. I was with them 15 years and I had over 180 cases. Okay, in the beginning, in 1983, now this is when I obtained my private investigator's license. Now this was very exciting. Um, I got chased and a belief shot at. I was pop, 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 but I was a little too far away. People don't like, especially when it comes to extramarital um, fooling around with with other people you not should not be fooling around with. I took a lot of pictures, and the only thing is uh, how exciting that is that um, it did not pay my bills. So I decided to say, hey, I'm going to take talk to the agencies, and I became a security officer. They set me up at a building in McLean, Virginia, BDM, uh, which stands for Braddock Don McDonald. I was the first shift day security officer. They gave me a secret clearance. And at the time, I didn't know what took place in the basement, which we had a skiff. This is a sort of a vault for people to conduct classified, highly classified um, talks and sh sharing files and whatnot. And the two gentlemen on, the, on your left, um, that is Albert Stubblebein. He, this is a gentleman I used to see every morning, escort people in during those conferences. And John Alexander, I'm sure some of you heard of him. He's written in a couple of books on UFOs. But there are a lot of strange things that took place within the basement of this building. And at the time, I didn't know, I didn't have the need to know. But later on, I find out that the what took place down there, they were doing all sorts of strange ESP, um, remote viewing, and try to read minds. So let's go to the next slide. Now, a little bit about this group. During, I'm going to read it. Uh, during the late 70s and 80s, a small scale secret unit would gather around Washington, D.C. area, military bases, and that would include BDM in McLean. Um, there were primarily involved remote viewing, clairvoyance, out of the body experience, and a lot of weird stuff. The Cold War. During the Cold War, the CIA and U.S. Army Secret Psychic Warfare Program was later called the Stargate Project. That name was developed during the early 90s. Now, in 1987, there was a covert research group uh, of 17 members, team from the United States intelligence community and military, known as the UFO Working Group. The main purpose was to examine reports of unidentified flying objects and related subject. Now, this is part of what took place in the basement in the building. Uh, by the way, let me just step back a little bit. The buildings in the center screen, BDM and in the back, CIA, um, they demolished these buildings about five years ago, so I'm allowed to talk about it now. Um, now, as Stephen mentioned, the government has been investigating UFOs since the 1940s, so I don't care what they were saying. We don't have time. We, uh, we're not interested in it. That's a bunch of nonsense. They're still at it. Now, in case you're wondering about the strange cup of coffee vibrating, there's a story behind that. I was working two shifts. They put me into another building in the back and ordered. I got a coffee. I sat down behind the desk. And all of a sudden, my coffee started to vibrate. It went away, a few seconds later it came back, vibrating again, and it, it, it kept doing this for a few minutes, and I was looking at it, and I said, should I drink this? <laughs> so 
and then it went away. So the, the evening shift supervisor within the security department came in, and I guess I'm allowed to say his name. His name is Bob Marple. He's no longer with us. He came in in the lobby to do a quick inspection, and he looked at me, and I said, Bob, what's up with the coffee? There's a lot of vibrating. I said, what's going on in this building? It was just a general question. And he looked at me, his face turned bright red. He goes, young man, that's none of your business. I said, okay, okay, I won't ask. So, don't ask. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, this poster, uh, a movie came out um, about this group and of course they made it a comedy about the group who would gather trying to utilize ESP, uh, remote viewing to spy on the Russians, uh, even one of them staring at a goat and the goat will have a heart attack and fall over. Uh, but they, they made it a comedy, a real strange comedy. So. Um, there are a lot of people are aware about it, and all this information is in the internet if you want to look up. Now, back to this case, which was a MUFON case, 8103 in Hope Mills. Um, I was called in to go down there to investigate Christopher Bledsoe, and I could talk about this for a couple of hours, but. I will make it quick. It's in my book, chapter three, all the details about this case. I was sent down there. I met with him and his son, which took part of the, the sightings. We went down to the river's edge, which was a few miles away from his house, and began to tell the story. He, three of his friends, and his son were fishing at the edge of the river. Uh, and the river, the name of the river is Cape Fear River, by the way, which is pretty cool. And Christopher decided to, I said, look guys, I need to walk away, get some fresh air. I'm just not feeling well. He put his fishing pole down, walked away, walked up to a dirt road into a f flat, it's a field. There's some horses running around there. And all of a sudden, as he was walking up the hill, he could hear crackling of leaves on each side, branches cracking, and, and he was like, what the heck is going on? I feel like I'm being followed. And he kept on walking, and this noise followed him up, upward. And, and I said to him, you know, if it was a deer, they would probably just run away, and jumped away and ran because they, they fear humans. So finally, he was starting getting a little nervous, and f as he reached the top of the hill, he looked over to his right, and he saw the sky basically open. And he, the term he uses is unzipped, a sphere, a ball that was orange, glowing sphere, shot straight out and all the way down to the end. That was a few, I would say about a quarter of a mile away. And this orb joined two other orbs. So there were three orbs hovering, and he just stopped and started to panic. He didn't know what it was. It looked like the setting sun. So what he did, he squatted down and trying to back away and hide. And the next thing he told me that he was running down the, um, the dirt road around and met up with his friends. They were still fishing. And he found out his son was, wasn't there. And he panicked. He goes, where's my son? And he, one of the guys said he was just walking around looking for deers. So I'm skipping a lot. The guys, after that, the son met up with him at the edge of the river. Lights came down right in front of them on the other side of the river. And, and they're all like, what the hell is that? And they started to panic. They dropped the fishing pole, all the gears down. They all ran into the cab truck, jumped in. He stepped on the gas, they took off. Now, 
the guys were literally screaming. They were scared to death. They thought it was an invasion. And um, his son, sitting in the back of the cab, looked behind while the truck was hauling away and saw one of the entities in humanoid form change into an animal and start chasing on four legs, chasing after the truck. He started screaming. He went up the hill, and this spiked UFO was blocking the path. And this is an actual photograph for the field that I took. I just added the uh, graphics. And they were blocked. Nothing was about the size of a bus hovering and said, oh, we're stuck. We can't, there's no way. They took a, a right turn. There was a mobile home, and they were trying to reach someone there, trying to access their telephone. The lights were on. No one was in. And they said, what are we going to do now? We're stuck. And all of a sudden, he looked at the UFO. The spike retrieved, retreated inside. It became a, a smooth, oval shape. It hovered around, shot straight out. I said, this is our chance. They jumped in the truck, took off. He drove them to their homes. He went back to the house. I'm skipping a lot of details. But after they got to the house, they were alone. It was just him and his son. Ran in, locked all the door, turned all the lights, and they just sat on the couch, and they were shaking. So they were pretty shook up. And then the dogs start. They, he has a kennel in the back. It had maybe about 10 dogs, and they start screaming and barking. And I said, oh, what's going on now? And open up the door. He went take a walk in the back. His dog, domesticated dog, was inside of the house. She took off running to the kennel. And he finally arrived. The, all the dogs were facing in the back of the yard. They were yapping, screaming, and then his dog, I forgot the name of the dog, she, her back was curved, hair is raising, and she was just waiting, and he couldn't see anything. It was totally dark. What he said is, the dog named Rose, Rose, get him, and she jumped all over the place and disappeared in the darkness, and what he did is he decided to walk around away from the bushes and trees on the lawn and decided to walk all the way down and take a left, waiting for Rose to push whatever animal that was out there. He thought it was a raccoon or a fox. He walked around and all of a sudden he came face to face to a glowing entity about this high, four feet tall. And this thing was just standing there, glowing, two red eyes. And he just sat there and said, oh. And they said, OK, you got me. I'm giving up. And all of a sudden, Rose jumped over a bush, landed right in front of it. Right before she, the dog, hit the ground, the entity went, disappeared. And said, oh. And said, Rose, let's get back. We need to get back. And he didn't say anything to his son, because his son was already emotionally disturbed. So. I'm going to stop giving too much details on this. So that is the entity on, on the photograph. This is the actual photograph of where the entity stood. I added the illustration on there about the size. So it was about three to four feet in height. So Wolfon, when uh, James Carrion called, he said, go down there, investigate, take over the case. I received the uh, case file from the field investigator. And they, when I got there, I took some readings, um, Geiger counter, electromagnetic, and there was really nothing there. Uh, by the way, I forgot to add a detail. This, he waited about a year before contacting MUFON. So there's a lot of evidence that may have been um, I guess, unusable or disappeared because of the weather and all of that. So I took some samples of, there was, I'm sorry, there was also a 
burnt circular um, mark on the lawn. That was about maybe, I don't recall the size, oh, it's about eight foot diameter. I took some sample within the, uh, sh the uh, burnt area and a control sample on the outside. I gathered some, if you can see the branch that curves and you can see the orange, that is like flakes, which is sort of a fungus. That was the only tree on the property that had that. I took a sample of that as well. It was kind of strange that having this growth right under where the entity stood. So I thought it was important. Grab, bagged it, tag, send it in. Um, just a quick, I have the UFO over Earth on Discovery Channel. That was a couple of years. And I want to show something. The I'm sorry, it's a little dark here. Hmm. Okay. Um, they actually took my case, that case, and put it in the... Okay, let's move on. I'm sorry. I'm just... Okay, now, the reason why I have these three slides, uh, photographs, is that, going back to the Bledsoe case, I've noticed that um, when the sky opened up, I have three cases that's similar, and I would probably file that under the interdimensional doorways. Now, a lot of folks, wor uh, scientists talk about wormholes and all of that. That is sort of where I'm leaning towards. Having spacecraft fly millions and millions of miles to hover over New York, scare the heebie-jeebies out of people, and then they fly back, it doesn't make any sense to me. So while Christopher Bledsoe was on top of the hill, I, 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 uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sky opened up, an orb shot out of it. It closed, it joined with the other one. So now the next slide over is UFO case 57661. Now, it was a, a woman and a man who just came back from the 4th of July celebration, a local park, and they drove back home and walked up the, uh, the path, unlocked the door, and he just threw the keys on the uh, desk. She walked in the back of the living room, opened up the curtain, and she saw this cloud, a vortex, going around in circles. Now, if you can imagine, when you look at a satellite view of a hurricane, it had that vortex. And all, all of a sudden, this thing opened up, a lot of lights flashing, like an inner storm. A classic flying saucer just shot straight out over her head. And she looked up and said, whoa. And she's starting to freak. And then she looked in again, two more flying saucers shot out of there. And then this thing closed up. And she goes, and then she goes, honey, please come here. I just saw this. He goes, yeah, sure. So that was a fascinating case. And it makes me wonder that, hey, these wormholes are pretty much like a shortcut if they want to get to Earth um, fast. The next slide over, and now this case, it's high strangeness. X-Files mixed with all sorts of, um, that's a MUFON case, 34904. Now, that involved another vortex that would open up, and it looked like it was a hovering craft, but it didn't, it just stayed there. It didn't shot out because these Entities were aware that they were aware that they were being watched by two two witnesses, and I'm going to talk talk more about that. 
Oh, and by the way, that case that case was highlighted in the Hangar 1, the UFO files. And the two gentlemen that was co-host, they're not here yet. So that's Tony and Ben. Um, they haven't arrived. Um, I think I missed. I kind of jumped ahead here. Um, back to this case. The gentleman you see in the photograph, um, from the beginning, he, his wife went outside to look, to walk into her car to pick up a baggage, and all of a sudden she sees in the backyard this glowing light hovering. And she thought it was a helicopter or a medevac or something flying, and he goes, that's strange. I'm not hearing any noise. She went back into the house, asked her husband to come out. He goes, we take a look at this. So he went out, looked at it. He goes, wow, that's strange. So what he did, he went back in, picked up his spotlight, and started communicating with it. I, myself, would not do that, but so he did it, and all of a sudden, when he flashed the light three times, the light dimmed and came back on again. He did it a couple of times. And all of a sudden, the light, we're talking about a couple of minutes later, and there's a whole lot of other, he saw shadows and weird things flying around during that time. The sphere decided, uh, went over his house slowly. He ran in. He goes, honey, let's get in the car. We're going to chase after it. OK. So they got into the car. It was a Ford tourist. Closed the door, started the car. Click, click, it wouldn't start. All of a sudden, the radio started to make a lot of strange static sound. And it's I said, what, what's going on? The radio's not even on. And so it's almost like these entities were trying to communicate, but apparently it didn't get through. Maybe they didn't have FM back in, those, in, in the aircraft. So it flew over and started to head westward. Start the car again, it worked. It started chasing after them, after the uh, orb. And then they were dr driven about three miles. And then it was starting to get really dark. And all of a sudden, a couple animals were running across, a fox and a deer. And I said, what's going on? Some, something is scaring these animals. And then he drove. He, at an intersection, he stopped the car. There was another vehicle at the side with a guy outside looking straight up in a trance. And he didn't blink. He just sat there for 30 to a minute, paralyzed. So I said, that's interesting. So they decided to so just ignore this continue chasing after this thing. I have a feeling this guy may have some missing time. But anyway, um, they went all the way down. And the light decided to stop over a house. They went out, and they looked at it. And then this is when the light blinked out, a hole from the sky opened up, and this craft that I showed you appeared. And then it hesitated. It closed. And the light took off. And OK, that's enough of that. That's enough of strange. So they went back home. So I got, I got called. But during all this time, this guy at home, uh, there was a lot of strange thing going on within the house, shadows. And being a in paranormal investigator through uh, for at least 20, 25 years, I, ha I warn a lot of people in the field, uh, please be careful when you're trying to communicate with whatever is out there. Um, ghosts, aliens, or shadows. So you don't know what you're fooling with. They can follow you home, piggyback. And I got in trouble myself one day. And it took me a while to 
the term is cleanse it out of my system. Okay. Now, I call this a rectangle spectacle. Now, these graphs are very rare, especially when it comes to a shape. Now, everyone seen triangles, orbs, and the classic flying saucers, oval. But this one, I have two cases like that, that a rectangular platform would hover. And this young lady, um, she was driving, it was westward, and it was during the setting sun. And she saw this lights above her, and she looked at it, and I said, what the heck is that? I thought it was, she thought it was two airplanes, but it was hovering very slowly, turning above the, um, the highway. And she stopped, pulled over, and looked at it, and it was almost translucent, but yet she, it was opaque, so she can see through it, but she knew it was a solid. And it took about 10, to, uh, 15 minutes to hover over the road and towards the mountains. So she was not really scared, but fascinated with this flying object. And she submitted a report, and I got it. Now, at the bottom, you could see what does this shape reminds you of. Now, when I was looking at that, when I was doing the slides, if you look at it now, these flying carpets in, in um, the genie and Aladdin make you, makes you wonder internationally, these things will probably made appearances throughout the planet. And I'm looking at these two, and it um, makes me wonder if the concept or the whole idea behind flying carpets probably derives from one or two or maybe a few of these flying objects flying over Persia during that time. So it's fascinating. Okay, this case, I put that case in. It's really one of my case, you know what, I'm going to read it. Now, this is a historical, historical case that took place in 1994. The case were given to me in 2015. So, I'm not clear why he waited that long to submit a report, but I'm going to go ahead and read it. In uh, Tuesday, September 27th, 1994, Shortly after 9 p.m., 19-year-old uh, Jeff left work during a night shift and proceeded to go back home. So he drove, met at a tee, so, and then looked over to his left and saw a light and said, well, I really want to go home. I'm tired, but what's with the light? So he decided to make a left turn and drive towards it. So he did. Um, deviating from his normal route, Jeff decided to have a better look at this mysterious object. As he approached Pulaski Count County High School, which was right across on the other side of the road, he turned into a subdivision. And this craft, he got a good look at it. It was lights everywhere, saucer shape, and it was hovering away from him. He pulled over, and almost like the craft was on top of a house, it turned, and almost like it got scared, it went to the next house. And what this, what he witnessed is that the saucer hovering over the house emitted a beam, almost like a laser, scanning through the house. And that, for me, that it's, it blew my mind. It's almost like it was scanning for 
for someone asleep so they can either abduct or have these uh, the body levitated or so it scanned and pretty much stopped the light retreated and then you got a little close and then it started hovering away and it flew away so that's for me within the world of ufology makes sense if these aliens are looking for a victim i would probably do the same scan the area see a victim take this person in um and one thing about jeff noticing across there was a high school he noticed there was a car parked and the not the headlights but the parking lights were on and it was where's that car doing there the school is closed it's at night and so he felt that they were aware of what was taking place across the road so he kept that in his mind and wrote a report send it 21 years later now the report some footnotes that jeff ultimately became a police officer after this so that's um it's a good thing for someone with a um a keen eye for details all right so this is some of my photos i took during my global explorations uh mexico 1995 in case you're wondering about this two mexican police officer um I stole a melon. No, I'm just kidding. Um, they, um, I thought they were pretty cool. One of them, the M16, I think, was almost as big as he was. Um, they said, hey, I'm going to take a picture. They got a little nervous when I approached them, but said, um, I had a, a interpreter. They said, don't worry, he just want to take a picture. Um, and by the way, the Mexican trip uh, one of the photographs I took, 35 millimeter, um, it was over a cathedral. It was an old, old church. And the sun was rising behind it. And I snapped a photograph. I said, okay, sunrise, it's kind of cool. When I went home, developed the photograph, the image of the sun, it wasn't circular. It was almost as a, a humanoid standing as it, it reminded me of the Virgin Mary apparitions and right around the photograph there was a halo so it's a fascinating photograph it's in my book I'm not saying it's the Virgin Mary but it's very unusual and I still have the negative okay um, we're running a little, I'm slowing down. Uh, just in case you're wondering, I work for Raytheon Technologies. I'm surprised that they have not pulled me aside to tell me, Norm, I want you to stop with this UFO thing. They didn't. Um, one of our little toys we are uh, de developing right now is a high energy laser weapon system that basically scans the sky and they shoot down drones. Now, there are a lot of drones out there. The Russia, Iraq, they have, they took drones and they put some type of explosive device. Either they crash it or they drop it. And this laser system, they just pop, 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 knocking all of those drones. Uh, the one here, I took a photograph of one of the experimental, and this is a quad cop cop copter, and that was shot down by the laser. So, and just in case some of the investigators out there want to try to use one of your uh, drones to fly over a military base to take some pictures, you may lose your toy. Um, and by the way, Tony Starks. Oh no! What happened here? Um, huh. Anyway, that's Tony Stark. He approved of that technology. 
Okay, moving along quickly. Um, Raytheon, during the Tic Tac UFOs I was witness over um, the West Coast and the um, F-18 Navy fighter pilots that w captured UFOs on both sides of the, um, uh, the ocean, Atlantic and Pacific, um, I found out later that the equipment that were utilized to sense radar and the, the FLIR system that captured and videotaped the Tic Tacs and the other UFOs they were chasing, the equipment is by, developed by Raytheon. Now, what Raytheon did during my research is that we have a website, and I was looking up, and I find out that Raytheon website in December 19, 2017, they are actually wrote an article for everyone to read. Hey, it's our system who captured those UFOs. I say, wow, that was brave. So a few months later, they took it down. So I think the guy probably uh, working at McDonald's. That was a no-no. Um, the reason why I added this photograph, Raytheon has a lot of scientists, a lot of ex-military intelligence, and I spoke to, we're friends, he's an ex-pilot, and I met him in the hall, and I said, hey, what do you think of the Tic Tac UFOs? and all what's going on out there. And he looked at me and he thought about what to say. I was, I was thinking that he got, he's gonna get scared. He's going, Hi, I'm not gonna talk about it, leave me alone. He didn't, he didn't do that. He just sat there and he looked, you know, Norm, that's very fascinating, very fascinating. But I never seen one say, so, yeah, I gotta go. So he took off, I spoke to another. He did, the answer was pretty much formulated. He goes, wow, UFOs, that's, that's pretty cool. But I never seen any. So it's almost the same answer. So they, I guess they wanna keep their job, but I am not, I did not expect him to share all the details of what he saw. They probably were told to, hey, just keep your mouth shut. You know? Um, okay, let's read. This is what Stephen was talking about. NASA came out with a group of super scientists and astronauts and uh, global explorers to try to investigate the UFO phenomenon. And what I've written I, from my field notes, the new group won't necessarily seek to determine exactly what the UAPs, which have been moving through restricted military air, airspace over the past decades, or rather, the team will look to hash out exactly how it's best for NASA to approach further study of the phenomenon. So that is one step forward, two step back. So, and there's even the government and some private groups, they're gonna, oh, well, we're gonna jump in and we're gonna study boots on the ground and we won't exactly know what they are, but we'll take notes. So we're not, we're not going anywhere with that. So, one more. Nope. This is Dr. Michio Kaku. Basically, that is the bottom line with all this research, is no Russian, United States, or Chinese crafts can do what UFOs do. This is beyond our technical capabilities as far as we know. So that's the bottom line. And one more quote from this cute guy. We all seem to have the same curiosity about what is really going on all around us, even if it's hidden in plain sight. So that's the end. Um, I do have a couple of books back there. Uh, my books are available online. Uh,